so guys, we're going to be talking about uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Thus Spoke Zarathustra is a book a lot of young guys, a lot of especially intellectually inclined guys read in their 20s. Uh, I, I, I read it read it in my 20s and, and revisited it in my doctorate, and I've been you know, re, re and revisiting it again. Uh, last summer, I spent about a month with it, and the and, um, uh, last few weeks, I've been basically trying to turn a course out of it. Um, and I'll, talk, I'll, I'll sort of preview a little bit of, of that. But uh, what I'm going to be presenting to you guys today is sort of a, an overview of, of the preface of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, introducing you to the main concepts and the main ideas behind it. I think um, if, if the preface doesn't really grab you, then the book probably isn't going to grab you at all. Um, it's kind of like a it's kind of like the perfect opener. And so like, you know, if, if it does grab you, then just go dive straight into the book. And, and if it doesn't, then it's probably not really uh, speaking to you. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll introduce some of the main ideas of the preface. And I'm also going to try to connect the main ideas of the preface to my sort of my own personal reflection, um, just to, I guess, maybe add a new perspective on the, on the book for those of it, you who are already uh, familiar with it and, and have maybe already spent uh, a lot of time with it, so let's 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 get into it, and then hopefully we'll have a lot of time to talk about it. Yeah, are we good. Yeah, okay. So uh, thus spoke Zarathustra, a book for none and all. Um, I think that that kind of like the subtitle kind of says a lot about what what this book is. I mean it. It, it, it's it's in my view kind of unparalleled in the in in the realm of philosophy in terms of the style at which it's written. Um, it's of course very poetic and and very literary. Um, uh, it's also sort of written from the perspective of a quasi fictional character. This is not to be necessarily taken literally as something that actually happened, although it likely does reflect a lot of uh, Nietzsche's own personal life to some degree. Um, and I guess what's the other the other main thing I wanted to say about it sort of, oh yeah, the, 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 the thing of it sort of standing out in the history of philosophy is that it might, I, I want to even say that it might be the, the best and first work that can be seen in what has emerged in the 20th century as a long line of let's say philosophy from without, uh, philosophy from without philosophy, um, or uh, even so far as saying it's an anti-philosophy. Um, it, it's kind of almost as if a lot of the major philosophical movements that have happened after the 19th century have come from individuals who have a strong disdain for philosophy. Uh, a disdain for philosophical style, a, a disdain for philosophical prose, a disdain for philosophical, the connection to the acad academic structure, uh, uh, connection to certain uh, norms and, 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 and rules governing the history of philosophy. And, and Nietzsche in this book in particular stands out as, a, as almost like a, a scream of anti-philosophy. And so, uh, and at the same time, such, a, such an important milestone and such a challenging book for 20th century philosophy. Many of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century from figures like Gilles Deleuze to Martin Heidegger, who are themselves kind of opposites, um, were, were hugely influenced by Nietzsche. Um, I don't think it's any uh, secret that Nietzsche influenced psychoanalysis, um, both Freud and Jung. Um, I know Lacan mentions Nietzsche um, a few times. Um, and he's still regularly engaged with today. So um, this book, just is just to say, sort of opening this book, uh, holds a lot of weight um, and has had an enormous impact. And I haven't even mentioned perhaps its, its largest impact, which is in the realm of, let's say, political theology. It had a huge impact on 20th century politics. Uh, and I've even heard some people say that it's had the largest impact on the development of Western religion um, in the 20th century. So safe to say this, this is a, this is a landmark book. All right. Um, and before I get into the preface itself, uh, this is also to sort of, um, function as a kind of preview for the course I've designed starting July 14th. Uh, it'll be the second course, uh, I, I'm, I'm leading through philosophy portal dot online. Uh, the first course was on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. And, um, 
you know, the, any course I do f through Philosophy Portal is going to be something that sort of strikes down the, the sort of core of my heart um, and will sort of reflect, um, how to say this, it will sort of reflect, uh, I guess, my own uh, philosophical um, metaphysic. So, so like the, you know, the approach I'm probably going to give to the Spokes Arthur is not only to sort of lead with a personal angle, but also to connect it to the work of Hegel, which I think is, if not novel, uh, at least an underexplored path in the history of philosophy. A lot of people use Nietzsche as an opposite of Hegel, um, including Deleuze. Uh, and um, I think the conversation between the two and how to set up a conversation between the two um, is um, something that's, that's a, a, a very interesting path to follow in philosophy. So check that out if you're interested. Uh, the main concepts I'm going to be describing today in the prologue uh, are first, the nature of the heart. Nietzsche has a very, um, I mean, I think if there's a central theme that runs through the Sp Spokes Zarathustra, it's the dialogue he has with his heart. And also the oscillation um, that takes place throughout the book as regards the fullness and the emptiness of his heart. Um, and this oscillation is very precisely in relationship to being away from humans, what he'll frequently call solitude. Um, and within, you know, within the human world, uh, what he'll often call the rabble. Um, so this, this, this dialectic of the heart, you can say, is, is yeah, probably the, probably the core um, of thus book Zarathustra. Uh, we're going to talk about the death of God and specifically linking the death of God. I think it's it's safe to say, at least from the reading of Thus Book Zarathustra, that uh, what he means by the death of God it has to do with perfection and imperfection, and, and specifically the death of perfect being, um, the way perfect being traps one from actually living, um, and sort of an affirmation of imperfection and a willingness to cultivate a mode of ethics of action uh, that can handle imperfection. Uh, then we'll talk about the overman. And I think it, it's safe to say also that it, it, it might be fair to, to describe the overman as a process of um, bodily slash soul overcoming. Um, and, and this is to, to collapse the distinction between body and soul into the body, uh, which is, I think, Nietzsche's basic move. Um, is, of course, not to link the soul to another world, not to link the soul to anything eternal, but to link the soul to the body. Um, and that also, I think, is uh, something which we can say anticipates psychoanalysis. Um, the overcoming as an abyss, uh, occurring over an abyss. So basically, we have an abyssal process. We have a process with no background. We have a process with no nothing behind it. Uh, it's just an abyssal process, and that process is nothing but a self-overcoming. Um, this is sort of the, the metaphysic, if you want to call it metaphysic, that Nietzsche's um, articulating. Uh, at the same time, we're going to be talking about the opposite of the overman, which is the last man, and the last man refuses self-overcoming. Um, the, over, the, the last man does everything to stop self-overcoming, um, and, and you could say that the last man, in some sense, institutes a type of... Uh, uh, a type of a type of fake background um, to cover over the abyss, to to prevent confronting the abyss, um, and, and also to prevent the next concept. This what entails this constant overcoming is specifically what Nietzsche would call a a sacrifice and a risking of life itself, uh, a daringness to live, a, a courage to live, um, a, a, yeah, a, a, an enormous risk taking, a, a, what he'll frequently call a a rolling of the dice um, to 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 dare to 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 throw the dice and and to and to not have any guarantee that there's nothing guaranteed. Um, you could, you're, you know, even I, I just read a passage today of him talking about the loneliest vision being the man who uh, envisions the climbing to the greatest height, um, even though it's inevitable that you'll fall. Um, so, so, so no matter how great you're striving, you're doomed to fall uh, and, and, and ultimately collapse into the abyss, but, but nonetheless to, 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 to roll those dice and uh, to take that risk. Uh, 
Um, and, and he says that in order to, to be that type of entity, we, you need to be someone with a constantly revitalized sensation. Uh, this is not necessarily, you know, I, I think teaching this um, in a presentation style has a certain benefit, a certain conceptual clarity. Maybe something will click into place uh, by, by watching a presentation like this. Um, certainly by me making something like this, it's helpful for myself to, to sort of get a conceptual clarity. Um, but that's, that in itself is not going to do the trick or the work when it comes to revitalized sensation. So like, for example, <laughs> 10 minutes before uh, I, I came on here, I was, I was in a cold shower. This is, it's more, more bodily work of, of revitalizing your sensations that, that Nietzsche is talking about. And um, this, this capacity to uh, engage the world in a fresh way and a constantly refreshing itself way. Um, and then finally, he says that, you know, ideally, yeah, you don't, you don't want followers, you also don't want to speak to the masses or to the herd or to the rabble, but you want to find the others, so to speak. This is, this is kind of also something that runs throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra is find the others, um, you know, the others who are, who are also sort of aware of this metaphysic and are committed to this sort of um, way of being or way of becoming. Is probably a better way of saying it. So uh, it starts off, it starts off um, it, with the heart in solitude, and Nietzsche's. He, he tells us that Nietzsche's there. Nietzsche tells us Zarathustra spent basically his thirties, an entire decade, in isolation and spiritual withdrawal, um, and and that you know it's it's kind of it's kind of um, implicitly um, communicated that. There was something deeply wrong in Zarathustra's twenties. That the you know the way he was living was 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 uh, spiritually empty, um, and that this caused the isolation and the spiritual withdrawal. So, uh, and he says this withdrawal leads to a heart filling, and, and that you know, he he fully enjoyed his isolation. He fully enjoyed his aloneness, um, and 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 there's also this type of you know. Uh, almost like a communication. When he talks about communication with his heart, uh, he, he's often talking about something like a, an inhuman communication. I don't want to, it's definitely not a human communication. At the same time, it's not a, let's, it, I, I think it's fair to say it's like, a, it's a communication with what he'll frequently call like godliness, not God, but godliness and, and a godliness of this world, not a godliness of an other world. Um, uh, but but also sort of this 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 dialectic that runs throughout the filling of his heart in in solitude is there comes a point in his solitude where he has to return to the human world and and this comes from this idea that the heart fills but it doesn't just fill it overflows um, and it's from this overflowing. Uh, that he returns to the human world and and this dialectic actually continues throughout the entire book. Um, the major parts of the book are structured by um, his withdrawal and return and this emptying and filling. Um, and, and, and always when there's a filling, there's a dream and a vision uh, with a new message, uh, something new to say, something new to communicate, um, which, which impels him, uh, which, which, which demands he return to the human world. So, uh, quote, in the mountains, he enjoyed his spirit and his solitude, and for 10 years, he did not tire of it. I must go, and then a uh, break, and he said, I must go down as the human beings say, this cup wants to become empty again, and Zarathustra wants to become human again. So th th there's a lot here um, in, in terms of, like, basically, you know, Zarathustra wants to become human again. Again, that points to this inhuman connection with the heart. Um, that he was not human in this state, um, and, and also the emptying, you know, so he's full, there's overflowingness of the heart, and, and to become empty again means he wants to give himself to the human world, and he wants to, and, and this foreshadows, he wants to give himself to imperfection. Um, also, I think it's important to emphasize that he enjoyed his solitude, he enjoyed his aloneness, this capacity to genuinely enjoy your own company is something that is a central philosophical uh, maxim for, for Zarathustra or Nietzsche's Zarathustra. So 
in my own experience with these reflections, it's kind of like throughout my entire doctorate, I was I was haunted by images of running away from civilization. I, I remember frequent conversations with people when even moments where I thought maybe I wouldn't finish my doctorate, where um, I, I always had visions of running into the forest or running away and just and just being alone, you know. And, and I never necessarily acted on those images and the extreme of those images. But I did necessarily take a lot of distance from other people. I did cut a lot of, I, I did become more recluse. I did become more sol solitary, especially before I became sort of um, more active online. I, I, I basically shut myself down and I had the opportunity kind of to shut myself down and, and isolate myself. So I, I understand the motivation here. I understand where Nietzsche is coming from with this, with this, this, this reclusiveness and this solitary motion. Um, and it did come from a feeling um, that human relations and society were just drive. So like the imperfection of human relations, specifically like the master slave relations uh, or, or domination submission games, whether they were in professional society or whether they were in sexual relationship, um, there was this feeling like human relationships themselves were a, a trap. Um, that needed some distance. I needed deeper reflection to before I would return to human relations. Um, and then from that withdrawal, this feeling like, okay, I can return to the world. And, and in, my, in my experience of it, I, I basically have used this tool as to, to not be on a mechanical, not to be on a mechanical schedule. Um, if I don't feel like creating, I don't create. If I don't want to interact with people, I don't interact with people. Um, so, so I do go through oscillations of um, creating and relating to others and basically shutting myself down and withdrawing from others. So it, it need not be, whenever we think about what Nietzsche is trying to tell us in Thus Book Zarathustra, we need not um, directly identify with the extremes of the message, um, but we can nonetheless take what he's saying um, and, and apply it to our life in our own sort of process of, of figuring out who we are, becoming what we really are, let's say. So the second main concept of the, the idea of God is dead, which is, is fundamentally connected to Nietzsche and probably the most um, popular concept that's, that's associated with Nietzsche's name, this idea that God is dead. What does he mean by that? Well, in the book, it's clear he meets a saint uh, before he reaches the human world on his way down from the mountains. And the saint tells him, we cannot love humans because they are imperfect and we must love animals and God. Um, and, 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 you know, <clears throat> you know, this, this emphasis on loving animals and God over humans, um, I think has to do with, uh, our being in language, you know, um, animals, we don't communicate to them with language. We don't need to deal with them responding to us in language. And, and the same thing for God, we can, we can speak to animals and we can speak to God, but it's a kind of a one-way communication. Like even if, even if you're praying to God, I mean, God and you even hallucinate a, a response from God um, it, it's kind of not a in human language let's say and the same thing for animals animals aren't going to respond to you with language so there's this type of imperfection of entering the symbolic order that, that comes with with human relationships and and that has a certain effect on our identity um, where we do need that spiritual withdrawal um and 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 also the saint emphasizes that it's fatal to interact with with humans that not not only it's not only just because they're imperfect but but because you know you, you you're gonna you're, you could get yourself killed emotionally uh dealing with these human relationships and so 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 this is sort of the 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 message the saint is giving to zarathustra as he's coming down from the mountain and Zarathustra then to himself, and he doesn't say this, he doesn't, this is crucial, he doesn't say this to the saint, but he, he, he says to himself, um, oh, the saint doesn't know yet that God is dead. And what he means by that, I think, is perfect being, um, that, 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 that there is no more capacity, there is no more, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're no longer in this infantile mode of believing that there's a perfect being watching over us or caring for us or or, um, or, or that's going to save us from ourselves, basically. Um, and, and he also points towards in this reflection that, um, that, that he is bringing the gift to humanity of loving imperfection. And I even think that that is an ethic that Zarathustra articulates 
um, which which it, it, it orients the pathway of the overman. This capacity to be in the human world and to love imperfection and to see, and, and the person who can bring himself as a gift to other human beings that, you know, to be the one or to be the one, the ones who uh, do not demand perfection and, and can see the beauty in your mistakes and can see the beauty and, and, and the, the, the potentiality in your imperfection. That's, I think, the, the gift Zarathustra wants to bring. Here, quote, now I love God. This is, this is a quote from the saint. Now I love God. Human beings I do not love. Human beings are too imperfect a thing for me. And then Zarathustra in reflection to himself, could it be possible this old saint in his woods has not yet heard the news that God is dead? Um, so, so again, this, this, I think this relationship here between imperfection and perfection is important. Um, the relationship between the human world and spiritual withdrawal is important. And Zarathustra sort of uh, being between the oscillation of the human world and solitude, uh, taking his distance from humans with the aim of coming back to the human world and being capable of withstanding the imperfection of things. So I know for me in, in, in this, in thinking about these things, it's like, I, I always have a kind of voice in the back of my head that, that's kind of skeptical when I meet people who privilege the love of animals and God over human beings, because I always think it's kind of a cheap way out. It's kind of a, a sneaky way out. Like I, I think like, well, it's, it's quite easy to love your pet dog, for example, right? Like it's kind of easy to love um, an, an animal that, that, that you have so much power over and that can never really stand up for itself, right? Like it's, is that really love at all? Like, do, you know, do people who privilege love of animals and God, do they really understand what love is in the first place? I've always had that sort of voice in the back of my head. Um, and at the same time, I understand the fatality involved in loving humans, whether that's in a professional context or a sexual context or, or a friendship context. Um, you know, I, I understand. And I also, and I think it's also under, it's, it's, I think it's also important to emphasize not only uh, is there a fatality involved in loving humans when it comes to someone, another human betraying you or doing you wrong or, 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 or not paying attention or, or, or not, not sort of seeing you? But I think there's also an important thing to emphasize that you yourself are, um, you know, a, a killer. Let's say, you know, you, you yourself are fatal. Um, you know, you you have to really go to the depths of your own drive, and 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 that involves, I think, the killing drive as well. So that so that there's a there's a there's a dimension to this that I think is important to bring into self reflectivity, and I think that's where the spiritual withdrawal is important to to really be with those emotions and to explore the way in which you have violent tendencies and, and, and you are a fatal uh, entity. Um, so to, to really love humans, I think you have to cultivate a deep aloneness. Um, so, it, it, you know, and I've, I've always also sort of been skeptical of, of people who, and this is basically since I started in academia, I think for the most part is, I've always been skeptical of people who overly socialize and it's not my nature necessarily to overly socialize, but I also skeptical of, of, of when I see someone overly socializing because it, it, it's almost like, um, you know, can that person really stand themselves? Um, can, can, you know, can they be with themselves? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's that, again, that oscillation between the alone and the human world that's important to cultivate, uh, to really be able to love. And I think that that is a good model also for an intimate relationship, an intimate partner relationship. It, it, it's, it's a trap to, to, to stick too tightly to your partner, like to, to never have a lone space. Um, and then it's also a trap to sort of create a, a, a strong uh, guard up against ever being close with another human, right? So it, it, it's, again, it's, it's an oscillation, it's a dialectic. Uh, so the overman is a concept, which is probably the next most important concept in, in Nietzsche's work. You know, I don't think we can understand really the full weight of this concept unless we really understand it, that we're, we're now in the Darwinian universe. We are now in the universe where we understand our relationship to the rest of life. We understand that we came from life. We came from the biological world. We are organisms 
first and foremost, that's something that runs through Nietzsche's philosophy. We are organisms. Uh, and at the same time, there's a telos uh, in Nietzsche, which is not present in the Darwinian universe, which is um, a telos of, it's derived fundamentally from an emotional relationship, which is, he, said, he asks us to contemplate what is an ape to a, to a man, a joke, an embarrassment. Uh, in other words, you know, we, we go to the, we, we put animals in zoos. Uh, we reflect on them. It's an asymmetrical relationship. There is something about human beings, a certain cognitive capacity, a certain cognitive um, dimension of our being, uh, which separates us from the, the, the apes and which separates us from the organisms in some sense. And, and, and I think that that is, you know, in a philosophical sense, uh, there, there is a dimension of that which is, has to do with reflectivity. And he's trying to bring this reflective dimension uh, as profoundly as he can to, to, to our awareness. Um, and then sort of connecting it with the first idea, he says, well, you know, in the same way that we laugh at the ape, uh, the humans will be laughed at by the overman. He's trying to create an evolutionary analogy here between our future and the future and, and, and the past from which we derive. Um, and and that, that's sort of where we get the telos. Uh, and he says that the overman is the meaning of the earth, but it's a process of overcoming. And so that's interesting. Nietzsche is a very interesting figure to situate in this meaning crisis intellectual environment because, you know, Nietzsche here is saying, you know, it's, it's kind of in crisis is where you get the meaning because it, it, it's a constant overcoming of yourself. And that, 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 that is to affirm crisis and, and to constantly be in emotionally intense uh, states of being to, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not something that you can be comfortable. You can't, you know, it's almost like comfort. You get this idea that comfort is um, a type of, um, you know, uh, it's it's a type of defense against meaning. So like like in in order in order you know there, there's it's a sacrifice to have a meaningful life. You you have to be overcoming yourself. Um, and then he makes a, a, what what becomes a very crucial distinction in his philosophy, which is the distinction between uh, the religious lovers of God, where he he claims the soul wants heaven, uh, and lovers of overcoming, where he says. The body is a soul, and 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 he has this really profound line where he talks about, you know, it's not what your soul thinks about your body, because basically he says the the religious or the lovers of God, they they, they their soul hates their body, and their soul wants to go to a disembodied uh, state of being. This, I, I'd imagine, Nietzsche would also sort of say is um, a crime of the transhumanists, who might also have a type of secular telos to evolutionary thought, but not, um, you know, he, he, I think Nietzsche would, would call the transhumanists also a, a haters of their own body. Um, so, but basically he, he says that, what does your body say about your soul? So when, basically, when you, when you ask questions about the state of your soul, ask yourself about the state of your body, you know, and that, and, and the speech of your body is the state of your soul, which is, which is, again, another nice, sort of um, philosophical prelude to psychoanalysis. I think. Here, quote, I teach you the overman. Human being is something that must be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? Uh, break. Uh, and then another quote, remain faithful to the earth and do not believe those who speak to you of extraterrestrial hopes. What does your body proclaim about your soul? End quote. So on the first the first reflection here is this, again, this emphasis that the overman is a, is a constant overcoming. That's what he's here to teach. This structures the entire book. Um, and also uh, his enemy, which is those who are speaking of an other world, those who are speaking of extraterrestrial or supernatural hopes. Uh, and again, to listen to the speech of your body, as opposed to the speech of the ego, which does not want your body. And, 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 and consequently, I think we'll get into this, hopefully we'll get into this. Um, what comes with that is a confrontation with an enormous amount of uncomfortable emotions, 
uh, the emotions that Nietzsche most, um, the, the, the emotions that Nietzsche highlights uh, are emotions like um, shame, um, guilt. Um, you know, he even would define the human being as the, 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 the animal of shame. You know, it's like you're covered in shame about what you are. And he, he always has references about, you know, the overman being, you know, confident in his nakedness. Um, you know, so these, these things run throughout Das Book Zarathustra. Um, so in my life, I think maybe why this book sort of connected with me so deeply throughout the years is that I spent a lot of my 20s studying the evolution of humans. I actually spent two summers in Cameroon studying the great apes. Um, and I was fascinated always with the connection between the human world and the great ape world. Um, they're, of course, our closest relatives. So the fact that he comes right out of the gate, the fact that he starts his philosophy with this, with this connection, the fact that he starts with this philosophy with this analogy is something that sits very comfortably, let's say, within the way I think about science or the way I think about the human being. Um, and, and I think also... Like there's no reason why Nietzsche as a philosopher can't speak very deeply to the scientific universe. And I think he does in many ways uh, speak very deeply to the scientific universe. Perhaps where he gets in sort of um, some conflict with a sort of scientism would be in the way he articulates his theory or maybe even doctrine of values. Um, and with, that's where we get into telos and we get into the orientation, but uh, certainly with his conception of evolutionary history, he's scientifically um, sound here. Um, and, and also when I was studying, um, you know, the great apes and human evolution, I think this naturally for me pointed uh, to the beyond of contemporary man and our potential. So I became sort of fascinated with transhumanism. I became fascinated in, in future potential technological uh, possibilities. Um, and again, I think that, um, you know, is it fair to say that Nietzsche would agree with my interpretation that he would think the transhumanists hate their body? I think it is. Um, and I do think now that I've sort of been through the transhumanist ideology, that there is a degree to which they are trying to get rid of their body with technology and that we need, to, and this is one of the, the very practical ways in which studying Nietzsche can help us perhaps solve some of these paradoxes of modern science when it comes to the scientific technological perspective on, on the body. Um, and and what, what, what is, I think, you know, Nietzsche pointing towards is actually something which we discuss in the IDW quite a lot is maybe a more tantric mode of being. It's a sort of a way of being with your body, not necessarily, you know, replacing your body with technology. So the human as a bridge. He, uh, Nietzsche claims that humans are only lovable as a bridge beyond themselves and not as an end in themselves. Um, so again, this is, is the idea that the, the overman is a process. It's, it's a bridge. That's the metaphor he uses. Um, it's not an end point necessarily. If we get into thinking about the overman as an end point, I think we, we miss Nietzsche's point here. Um, uh, but the difficulty with this bridge is that, uh, is, is that you know, to overcome yourself, you have to walk over an abyss. Um, to overcome yourselves, you, you know, the bridge is it extended over a void and, and you could fall off of the bridge because you're constructing the bridge as you go and you're going to make mistakes. So the possibility of falling off the bridge, the possibility of falling into the void, um, and this is where Nietzsche often gets connected to nihilism because, again, this is so important for the philosophy of nihilism is that there's no background. Uh, this is what you could call in theology or physics uh, background dependence. There's no background here. Uh, it's it's an abyssal background, um, uh, and so and so 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 that's sort of what makes the process of overcoming require so much courage and daring and 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 risk taking. Um, but for Nietzsche. The head cannot do this anyway. It, it has to be the heart drive. Um, and he points towards the heart. And that's why there's this constant communion with the heart, which is driving the entire book. Um, and, and he said, this allows the human to sacrifice their self for the meaning of the earth. Uh, that is the overcoming of man. 
So mankind is a rope fastened between animal and overman, a rope over an abyss. What is great about human beings is that they're a bridge and not a purpose. He also says that this is the key to being able to love humans, that if you are unconsciously seeing humans as an end, then you cannot love them because they're imperfect. Um, and they're going to, the, the, your model of them as an end is going to be, there's going to be an asymmetry between your model of them as an end and what they actually are, because uh, they're going to make mistakes. There's going to be cracks and gaps in your model. Uh, I think this is what makes intimate relationships impossible. Um, if, if, if you're not willing to see the other from the perspective of mistake, if you're not willing to see the other from the perspective of crack, gap, negativity, um, then you, you're not going to be able to really love the other human being. Um, but, you know, Nietzsche's here saying is what is great about human beings is that they are a bridge and not a purpose or an end. They're a process. Abyssal as it may be. So I, I think, it, you know, I'm reflecting on myself, it's hard to accept or recognize the way, you know, speaking to myself here, it's hard to, to accept or recognize the ways you're treating yourself as an objective endpoint. Um, you know, meaning that you have an unconscious object, you have an unconscious endpoint, which you are trying to reach, and you have this unconscious motivational structure, which is assuming that once you get this objective endpoint, that you will be somehow reconciled, you will be somehow removed from the burden of overcoming. Um, so uh, I think this requires, again, a lot of withdrawal, a lot of reflection, a lot of meditation. Um, and that it's dizzying to walk an abyssal path because there is ultimately no perfect model. Of course, God can be used as a perfect model, and that's what religious people do. But there, you know, what Nietzsche is saying here is that there is no perfect model, uh, and, and that you cannot sort of copy an other or, or or copy a model of what someone else is doing to become the overman. If you want to copy the other or copy a model you will be able to um, mimic another person. You will be able to sort of, that, but that will keep you within the codified language games of social society, of, of our normative social world. Um, but that's not what Nietzsche is talking about. He's talking about the overman. And, and so the overman cannot copy, the overman cannot mimic. Um, you can be inspired, you can be motivated by someone else, but not, but they're never going to be a perfect symmetrical uh, model for your, uh, for your abyssal, uh, process. Um, and so basically what that means is that you're required to connect your head to your body every day. It never ends. It's every day. It's constant everyday work. It's not going to cut. It, it's a lifestyle. It's not an end point that you can reach and then say you've gotten there, you know, and, and that this constant, I've already sort of pointed towards that this work really is about shame and guilt. And it's about shame and guilt about your own body. It's about your own organism. It's the fact that, you know, as, as intelligent and as cognitive as we may be, uh, I think we still do, we are still conditioned, um, not just by society, I think by our natural cognition as well, um, predisposed um, to have a dialectical tension with our own body, um, to be uncomfortable with, with our very own nature. Um, there, there's some modern reflections on how we are ashamed that even that we are born today, you know, that we are not machines, that we, that we do not re reproduce ourselves like a factory assembly line. Um, that, 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 and think about all of the things we have to accept to reproduce with another. Think about all the things we have to accept to, to have children, to have a partner, uh, to raise those children and, and, so, and so forth like that. And even to, to, you know, to engage in the sexual game, uh, consciously, to consciously engage with the sexual game. That, that involves confronting a lot of inner emotional mechanisms like shame and guilt. So uh, Nietzsche is now sort of saying, okay, he, you know, he's told us what the overman involves and, and he's, he's aware that, uh, and this is reflected in the book, he's aware that we may be shocked, we may be unable to process what he's telling us. Um, but he now juxtaposes what he's telling us with the last man. And I think he tries to make the last man sound so horrible that we'll be like, oh, well, I, I don't want to be the last man. So I might as well become, try to become the overman. You know, and, and to be fair to Nietzsche, I think this idea of the last man is still you know, hyper relevant 
to our contemporary world because if anything, I think Nietzsche would say that the last man has grown in number. Um, he says, the last man knows no love, no creation, no longing or stars. Um, and, and, and because all require an overcoming of the current version of the self. Um, you cannot really love someone if you're so self-enclosed. You cannot create if you're self-enclosed. You can have no longing if you are self-enclosed because all of those things involve an otherness. Um, the love involves the other. Creation involves the other. Longing involves the other. Um, and he says, the last man values pleasure, comfort. And this is very interesting. Longevity for its own sake uh, and does not know overcoming. You know, and I think what our society has, has, has ritualized uh, as a religion, and I think what our society has normalized is the last man. You know, Netflix and chill, pleasure, comfort, and also normalize this idea that we're all going to make it to 80, we're all going to make it to 90, and that the telos of our society is we want to live a long life for its own sake, even if we don't have a good standard of living, or even if we don't enjoy our lives, I want to live a long time. Nietzsche is against all of this. He thinks this is madness in a bad sense, or this is unconscious madness, um, and, and it's an inability to really live. Another thing he says about the last man is that the last man goes for cheap happiness. The last man wants quick reconciliation. The last man lives an unconscious social life. So, um, and again, I think that this is becoming normalized in our society. You know, people who are unable to um, sacrifice short-term happiness for long-term struggle, people who want a quick reconciliation in instead of really going to the core of conflict, you know, you know, there's a real difference between you and me, for example. An unconscious social life, you know, just living in such a way as that we do not shake the boat too much, you know, when it comes to social life. This is the last man. Here's a quote. The time approaches when human beings no longer launch their longing beyond the human. The time approaches when human beings will no longer give birth to a dancing star. Beware. Um, and I think that this is prophetic. I don't know what else to call uh, this, but prophetic. Um, because again, his description of the last man is kind of so fundamentally ritualized in our current society that it's, it's hard not to conclude that, you know, he, he saw what was coming, so to speak. Um, so yeah, just reflecting on myself, like when I think about my, me and my, me and my partner, when I think about love relationships I've been in the last five, 10 years, um, it brings you to your knees. The other brings you to your knees. You cannot be in a real relationship that goes deep to the core of what it means to love if you're self-enclosed. Um, you cannot create if you're self-enclosed. You have to sacrifice what you are. You have to have a certain contempt for yourself. You have to be able to, to negate yourself um, to, to really love and to really create. Um, and, and I do think, of course, pleasure, comfort, longevity for itself, they're always temptations. Um, I always catch my mind almost defaulting to these ways of thinking. So the consequence, I think, is that you just have to constantly be in a fight against yourself. You have to go to war with yourself. Um, and I think that they connected to other parts of this book that we have to stop externalizing conflict with people necessarily, unnecessary conflict. Um, and we have to go to war with ourselves. That's where the real war is. And, 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 and uh, we'll have better dramas. We'll have better conflict in our, in our actual lives if we are the types of people who first and foremost are on the front lines of the war with our own uh, temptation to the last man. Um, and finally, I think, you know, a lot of the principles I have for avoiding the last man here are, you know, on the one, enduring negativity over cheap happiness you know, learning from negativity, not necessarily just going for the cheap, quick fix. Um, that short-term conflict for long-term reconciliation, to, to embrace conflict. Um, and yes, we want reconciliation of some kind, but not if it's a cheap reconciliation. I want a real reconciliation that really goes to conflict because that means I'm putting my identity on the line. That means the person I'm in a relationship with has to put their identity on the line in order for reconciliation to be possible. And also bringing the cracks of social life to awareness, not allowing the unconscious dimension of social life 
to become tyrannical, um, to use relationships as a vehicle for higher awareness, as opposed to a vehicle for deeper unconsciousness and a deeper falling asleep, the avoid of the last man. So sacrifice and risking life itself. Uh, if you choose the path of the overman, this is the path you are choosing. Um, and that Nietzsche says here, we are looking to cultivate rivalry and skilled competition, which is dangerous because someone will eventually destroy you. Um, no, you know, no matter if you build a skill and you enter a competition, you even if you're the best, even if you're the best for a moment, um, you know, you will not, by definition, be the best forever. Someone will beat you. Someone will destroy you. There is no human on the planet that can be the best forever. So that is what's involved, is, is ultimately a willing towards your own destruction, your own annihilation. Um, that overcoming man occurs in this competition because it is a striving beyond yourself. If you're giving yourself to skilled competition and rivalry with other people, um, you're by definition striving beyond yourself because you, you know, a lot of people have so much fear around competing with other people because they're self-enclosed. They don't want to lose. Uh, this is another theme that runs throughout Thus Book Zarathustra is the capacity to lose, the capacity to accept defeat, to laugh at yourself, to, to, to accept that you know, you are a joke. That is again connected to, you know, what is the ache to a man, a laughing stock, a joke. You have to become a joke. You have to become a laughing stock to yourself. You know, and the overman is someone who's willing to take great risk and die for the pursuit of greatness. Nietzsche here is explicitly saying that I value someone who didn't just wait around for death to come to me, to, to, to me but I value someone who sought out greatness and died for greatness. That's the type of philosophy. That's the type of ethic that he is um, uh, working with. He said, quote, you made your vocation out of danger and there is nothing contemptible about that. Now you perish for your, now you perish of your vocation. And for that, I will bury you with my own hands. So he's here saying, this is, you know, Nietzsche's way of showing love and respect. You know, uh, I, I, I'm so, I'm, I value you so much. I'm, I, I value you so much as a representative of the overman that, that I will bury you myself. I will dig your grave because, because you were willing uh, to, 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 to go for greatness and to perish in that uh, vocation. So reflecting on myself, like no matter what I've dedicated my time to, no matter what I've dedicated my life to, whether that's sport or philosophy, uh, yeah, you need to learn how to lose. Someone will beat you. I, uh, you know, in sport, uh, you learn how to lose. Uh, in sport, you cannot win every game. You cannot always be the best player on the field or the court or the rink or the, you know, whatever it is you're playing. Um, and when it comes to philosophy, you know, like, you know, I teach a lot of young guys and I can see that a lot of them are absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, you, of course, one of them, one of them will uh, negate me one day, you know, some, someone will pass me by. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's just something that has to be accepted and, and, and uh, embraced. You know, I think if you embrace it, that's the, the wise thing. That's the mature thing. Um, and dedicating yourself to a skill and risking it all is, is the only way to see what you potentially are. Like, you know, if I didn't dedicate myself 100% to these skilled competitions, you know, I, I would be scared to see what I would be. I would be fat and lazy and unmotivated and, and you know, I, I wouldn't have a beautiful girlfriend or I wouldn't have seen the world or I wouldn't have, you know, uh, learned so many things from so many brilliant people. So, you know, th these are all things that you have to cultivate in yourself. And I think this speaks to a lot of young men probably in particular because, you know, this is what I think it, being a really great man is involves and and Nietzsche is speaking to women as well but I think let's be honest I think this book is speaking to to to, to it's going to speak most deeply to to a lot of men um and finally rather than waiting around for death pursue what is greatest in you and die for it I mean I I, I had in some sense you know the I, I saw what it's like for someone to wait around for death to come for them and it's, it's not pretty I don't necessarily want that I'm not necessarily looking for that if, if I if I'm 70 and 80 and I'm not living really a good life do I really want to be a, alive I'm not really so sure 
Um, you know, but do I want to pursue greatness and do I want to sacrifice for myself, myself for that greatness? That's appealing, you know, at least that's the way I'm trying to live. So, so there's a way in which this, this, this motive, there's a way in which this ethic does speak deeply to the way I would, I would want to live as I see the next decades of my life unfolding. In terms of teaching the overman, he says, the teaching the over, overman as the meaning of the earth cannot be done with abstraction. So, you know, insofar as this presentation is useful, that's great. But again, this is not necessarily about abstractions. Um, and, and, and we can only do so much in a presentation. We can only do so much in reading a book and so forth. Um, that the overman is refreshed by sensory perception of one's own being from a madness within. So the distinction here is that the last man makes the madness unconscious. The overman makes the madness conscious. You go fully into your madness. You accept your madness. You accept everything about yourself. You go into solitude. You accept everything about yourself. You confront all of the cracks. You confront all of the insanity and you shake it out. You are reborn every day. Um, this is sort of the way he's talking about teaching the overman. Um, and that as a consequence of doing that, you know, for a normal human being, the overman would appear as either a fool or doomed for death, that you're going to kill yourself. Or what the hell is that guy doing? That doesn't make any sense. Why? Because you're not modelable. You can't be mimicked by a normal human being. They have no idea what you are. They don't know how to, they don't have a reference point for your existence. So you're mad. You are a fool and so forth. Here, quote, I want to teach humans the meaning of their being, which is the overman, the lightning from the dark cloud human being, but I am still very far, but I am still far away from them and I do not make sense to their senses. So again, he's emphasizing sensation. He's emphasizing the sort of the base level unconscious interpretations that people might have about what he is or what he's trying to do. Um, and that what he's teaching is not in a classroom. It's a lightning bolt from a dark cloud. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lightning strike of madness. Um, and, and, it, and it's not about learning a certain set of abstractions. It's about overcoming the human condition itself, you know. So I think one of the reasons why I started gravitating towards dialectics was because I realized, you know, abstractions are inherently limited. And this is what dialectics also teaches. This is also at the ground of, for those interested in philosophy and the history of philosophy, you know, really German idealism, starting with Kant, is identifying this limitation in abstractions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the capacity to grasp the concreteness of our being. Um, and, and dialectics here um, are very useful because you can keep the abstractions fluid. You can keep them in a logical motion. Um, and, and when it comes to, to madness, you, you know, every morning, this is what I try to do, every morning you wake up, you have to shake yourself. You have to give birth to yourself again. I think we have to find ways as men and well, women as well, but here speaking to men, is, you know, women have to give birth to a child. Nietzsche speaks a lot about this. Um, men have to give birth to themselves. Um, and I think that, that that metaphor, that analogy has a lot of, weight it has a lot of distance you can go far with that that metaphor um and finally the alienation i often hear people feel they're alienated and they frame it as a negative thing they're alienated what from the social world nietzsche saying no this alienation is a positive thing um i think also we can we can read hegel in this way um that 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 you have to you know, negate this negation. You have to negate this negativity that actually what alienation is, and this is, I think, the best, the proper word is, it's a path to the alien. It's a path to the otherness of yourself. It's a path to becoming something that you couldn't have imagined that you would be able to become. Um, and I think I've seen this unfold in my own life. You know, like there's a lot of things that I've been able to do in the last 15 years, which my 18-year-old self would have just been blown away by would have been alien to my 18 year old self. So, and it comes from the capacity to alienate yourself from the social world. Uh, and again, to make your, uh, this is a, a metaphor from Nietzsche, to make a nest in the abyss itself, to, you know, to, to, you know, to nest in the abyss. This is the type of negation of negation that, that Nietzsche is working with. 
Finally, living companions. The overman needs companions and friends, not a group of followers for overcoming the self. So it's not here about trying to get people who believe in you or, or want to follow you or, or whatever. Um, it's not about creating a new church. It's not about creating a new congregation. It's about finding others equals who are uh, equal in their desire to overcome themselves um, and that you do not want to appeal to a herd but you want to create new values. You want to create new aims. What does that mean? It means that um, all of the models that you've used throughout your development are not, 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 going to, not going to work. They're not going to serve you. You're going to have to create new ones. And, and that's to be done with your companions, with your friends who are also committed to overcoming, not necessarily a group not necessarily a group or a herd identity that would lead us back to the same problem. So you can see here why a figure like Deleuze in philosophy would emphasize so much uh, individuation from Nietzsche. Um, uh, finally, normal humans by definition must be angry or misunderstand the overman because you're not operating by the same values. You're not operating by the same aims. Um, say, um, there are many passages in Thus Book Zarathustra where he talks about uh, other human beings, the rabble, being upset, frustrated, disappointed with him because they could not see the symmetry in value systems. They couldn't see the symmetry in structure of aim. Quote, companions, the creative one seeks, and not corpses, not herds and believers. Fellow creators, the creative one seeks, who will write new values on new tablets. So, you know, I, in my life, the most meaningful thing for me in my life has been to try to connect my work drive in relationship to friends um, and also trying to overcome that, you know, is the most meaningful for me. So, you know, like, it's not like I've ever been able to, like, say, reach the images in my head that I have for the ideal relationship between my work drive and my friends. But it's extraordinarily meaningful for me, you know, that if what I'm doing can be nested within a loosely connected network of people who I see are also striving to go beyond themselves, who are also trying to overcome themselves, um, and that we have some sort of um, reciprocal synergy with our work drive, let's say. And, 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 and there's no, again, there's no guarantees here. Um, you know, it's not necessarily going to work out, you know, it, you will, you will, you know, and even if you have divisions and you need to go separate ways from your friends at a certain moment, it's, it's not the end of the world. It's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean the friendship failed. It just, you know, it, 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 it's, it's sort of an ethic to constantly cultivate that motion in yourself. Um, so new values and aims force the questioning of all values and aims of adults known in development. All that means is, you know, when I look at the adult world that I grew up in, you know, I don't necessarily see those models as something that I, I, I need to follow. Uh, I, I don't know if that's what I want to follow. Uh, apparently, I don't want to follow that development because I'm doing something completely different. Um, I'm living in a different way. Um, there will be some similarity, of course, but because I'm, I'm still a human being. But the most important point is this constant self-questioning, this constant reevaluation of your aims. Um, and finally, most people will see you as an alien and they will not understand you. But my, my advice would be don't give that any attention um, or give it attention in an amusing way, almost as if you're walking around, you know, um, animals in, in, a, in a sense, like or unconsciousness is, is another way to say it. you're walking around unconsciousness. So it's basically, you know. There are some people who could say, for example, criticize me and it would, it would carry a certain weight. Um, but even then it's, it's, you know, I have a deep enough relationship with my solitude that I don't need to be moved or shaken by uh, others seeing me as somehow not understanding me, let's say. So again, this is sort of pointing towards uh, a much, this is that's the, the sort of the preface of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Uh, this is pointing to a, a much larger course, which is gonna go into the book in detail. Um, and we'll also have a collective creative project. Um, we'll have a presentation series. We'll have a, a conference. Uh, we'll have a book. 
uh, that we'll try to make from this. Um, and, uh, yeah, super excited about that. That's the way I want to spend my summer. And if you're also interested in, you know, really going into the cracks, going into the gaps of this book, really going to the core of it and with the other group of people who really also want to, to know the, the depths of this book, then, you know, check it out philosophyportal.online. Uh, again, these are the main concepts we covered and, uh, that's all. Amazing. Thank you, man. That was fucking awesome. That was fucking, that was the overman, motherfucker. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a shame that your, uh, your surname is last, not uh, yeah. Ubermensch. I think <laughs> right. we should rename you Pidel Ubermensch. <laughs> right. Well, we're, going to, we're going to Germany soon, so maybe, maybe in Germany. Yeah. Fortunately, <laughs> you're doomed to forever be the last man. There you go. That'll take it. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'm the last man, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be the uh, the the movie, the last man, the life and works of Cadell Last. Yeah, that's it. What I really yeah. liked is uh, I just want to say something is that I think that Nietzsche says that philosophy is a biography, right? And you're you do that more than anybody. You do philosophy as your own biography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's I what I that's what I I'm always appreciative of, of in, in a sense whenever I give a lecture besides the clarity of it and all that. Thank you, man. Yeah, that's that's definitely something that I've, I've learned a lot and has brought more of my awareness to in the last year is, is just almost, almost the irrelevance of abstractions if they're not somehow connected to your personal life. I mean, to me, they're more and more just irrelevant if they're not connected to my personal life. Because I don't, I don't know, it's not like, you know, I don't know, it's not like I'm like super older and I'm 35, but like I do notice a major shift in my body energy from 30 to 35. Like I don't have as much body energy as I had when I was 30, you know, and, and I, I, and I don't, uh, I'm not going to waste my time here. Like I, I'm, 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 I am connecting this to sort of like, you know, where I, you know, where I'm going. And also that by sharing, you know, what I've gone through and where I'm going, I think a lot of younger men can benefit from that. And hopefully younger women as well. Like I hope, like the you know men and women. Like I I, I want to go. I, I think that in the next five years, probably the biggest thing that will open up for me is the the, the sexual difference, men and women relationship. But not not a hundred percent there yet. Yeah, I mean Nietzsche really writes for men in a way. Yeah, I mean I think a lot of women love Nietzsche as well, but it's the over man. Like it's 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 he's trying to restore the masculine in, in some kind of a way. I, and I think so. I think that he could that that relates to men's groups and all that. Anyway, I, I think I think women would love Nietzsche the way women like uh, would show up at like Johnny Depp's trial or something like that. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, <laughs> like, like, oh, he's so hot. Like, he's so he's the. <laughs> I've known you know, a like, few over women in my time, though. Over, I've known a yeah. few over women. Sure. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway uber fan sure. let's uh let's let's do some questions i think yeah. i mean i would like one that i am um, that i'm kind of thinking to open up that actually we did riff around a little bit on cadell last week when we were in copenhagen but like you touch a bit on this thing about the nature of the heart and what the heart is doing and um yeah i wonder can you just talk a bit more about your ideas on the heart yeah, like it's it's a concept actually that I think is like not necessarily very. It's a metaphor, obviously. Like I, I'm not, you know. I think it, it's in my experience, it, it's pointing. It's you know, like how Bard says, like men are like this oscillation between logos and pathos. They're so like a, you know, and like like if I like analyze like my 24 hour cycle of myself, you know, like I'm 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 stuck between my dick and my head, basically. You know, like I, this is basically this is my oscillation, my daily oscillation, and I think. Like I've had experiences, like I, I, we've, we've talked about it. I've had experiences where like I, I break open in my, in my chest and you know, the image that, that, I, that, that, that speaks most profoundly to me is like kind of the Jesus image of like the, 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 the heart with the cross and the, like the barbed wire around the, around the heart. Like, so I think that's what he's, he's pointing towards, you know, funny enough, there's a lot of Christian, like there's a lot of Christian metaphors and images in Nietzsche's funny enough, like, for someone who's so connected to anti-Christianity, but basically I think the heart is a reorganization of the body energy and the nervous system. 
from this split between the head and the and the and the, the genitals and the and the head to something that's much more a, a sexual energy that's spread throughout the entire body and that you, you are that yourself you are yourself overflowing with joy you are yourself so you can so you know he has these these lines um where he talks about um i can give more to my enemy than you could give to your friend you know like he's so overflowing that like or like he has these lines where he talks about how like if someone attacks him that he kind of treats them like a bee who's lost their stinger like he says like you're too weak to attack me you know like take take back what you you've done type of thing like he's, it's this idea that he, he he's so overflowing with bodily energy um you know that he's 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 yeah it's it's his that's he's connecting that to like his whole drive you know it's like almost, it's, it's almost like he's it's almost like he's walking around the human world it's almost like like um you know like say say like your pet does something say your pet does something that like annoys you deeply or something like you know the, you know they, they they messed up the the living room or something they they messed up the kitchen like you know you wouldn't it's your pet you you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily like hold a grudge against your pet for that but like i think we hold a lot of grudges against other humans when they do us wrong and i think nietzsche here is like cultivating an ethic of like if, if someone does you wrong don't take it personally and almost almost like forgive them like for themselves you know like very how christian, could you... right? very he, christian he, yeah wow yeah, yeah. But there's I think a the lot more you read christian, christian, christian yeah yeah i think the more you read nietzsche you more the more you find that his rejection of christianity is actually an intimacy with christianity at the same time totally so he's bringing yeah. this intense christianity uh despite himself or, or i think the, maybe I not think even despite part. himself i don't know but uh, to me, I think the link between Hegel and Nietzsche, which is obvious, is I think they're both Christian atheists. I think I, I think that's the most accurate description of them. Like they're Christian atheists. Like I I, I don't know how to get how, how to get out of it. I mean, maybe Nietzsche is like more a subject of absolute knowing or something like that. But um, but nonetheless, like you can see that he has moved through a certain Christian ethos. You know, like that has had a profound impact on him. I think he was just like railing against like the institutions. I think he was railing against like the institutional structures. Like he, you know, he criticized priests. He considered, he, you know, he criticizes, you know, people who use images of the afterlife to stop living. You know, that's really his like main beef. Which is what Jesus would do in the temple when he was taking his sword yeah. and throwing up, at, throwing away yeah. at the money lenders temple, right? So very interesting absolutely and also at the end of his life he says i am the crucified one so it's it's quite uh, yeah yeah remarkable. exactly anyway yeah yeah i see i i see him as that type of figure absolutely anybody else have some questions here or... i have two questions actually the first one would be when the course ends the online course sorry when did it end Yes, so this course yeah. that you're holding yeah. this summer, when would it end? What month? What date? Uh, mid, mid, mid September. Let me get you the exact date. I have to just go to the site, but it'll be, it'll be mid, mid September. It'll, it'll end. We can do okay. the logistics at the end, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get, right. I'll get the date. And then uh, here's a question that what, what I've been considering a bit for personal reasons. So, so all, all of this philosophy I can understand and, and, perhaps uh, especially focusing on the risk taking part uh, how does one uh, you know um, integrate this I I into parenting and being a parent i mean in, even if risk taking is the best way to live uh, yeah. that that seems like uh, a potentially awful way to be a parent yeah great question uh, and i think that's uh -huh. a perspective i, I want to yeah. So there's a there's a there's in the first part of Thus Book Zarathustra, he speaks on marriage and children um, and, and being a parent. 
Um, and he actually, you know, it's very, I, I would actually, you know, recommend it, even if, if you don't take the course, get out the book and, and go to the section where he talks about marriage and children. It's in the first part. Um, and I think like he would say that if you've, if you've, if you've gone into marriage and if, I don't know if you're married, but if you've gone into marriage and if you've gone into having children from um, the perspective of overcoming yourself, he would say that you're already taking immense risk. Like to become a parent is immense, immense risk. To, to become a parent is overcoming yourself because you have to put someone else ahead of yourself, your child. Right. And, and so I, th I think like that, that's that's maybe not a full answer, but that's that's part of the answer. And I, I mean, we go deeper into those questions in the course, I suppose. But I mean, I think like at least when I reflect on myself, like I think when it comes to like being a parent, getting married, these things, I think a lot of people are scared of doing those things precisely because they're so self-enclosed and precisely because they don't want to take the risks involved therein of, 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 of doing those things. He often refers to children and he often refers to the, when he speaks to women specifically, like he, he says, you know, a man should be like a warrior who's constantly trying to overcome himself and a woman should be concentrated on raising the next generation of overmen, um, you know, this overcoming. So I think like, when you situate the role of the father, you might situate the role of the father in a similar, a similar light. Okay, yeah, uh, and, and now to be a bit square uh, and make it concrete. I mean, uh, risk taking in one's career, for example, well, I, I would say can, can be a great thing if you are a single and without children, but uh, when you finally have them, then that becomes more of a, a balance. And here, I don't know, does this talk anything about, you know, no, uh, 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 sacrificing one's own life uh, for, for one's children? Along those absolutely. Lines? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's a theme. One of the major themes that runs throughout his work is this idea of the child, uh, metaphorically, to find the child in your own self. Um, to you know, he, he has these lines about finding not a fatherland or a motherland, but a children's land. Uh, you know, to find the child within to, to, to find the child within your own self. Um, but also there are many lines of like, you know, if if you don't feel like you have your best creativity inside your own body, then raise the next generation of overmen or influence the next generation of overmen. Go be something that, that points beyond yourself. That's the, the point. And he said that you know the deepest revenge or the deepest hatred or the deepest problem that, 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 that people who become revengeful have is that uh, they, they no longer have the creative capacity inside their own body. And that's why they, 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 they hope for an image of something, you know, otherworldly. Can you say that again? He's basically saying that he thinks a lot of people who cling to images of otherworldly hopes, like supernatural hopes or extraterrestrial hopes, that these people actually hate their body because they are no longer creatively empowered you know, by their own body. So like, you know, if you think about having children, well, that's, that's creative power. You know, so he, his, his, his emphasis would be on, you know, not the otherworldly hopes, but on doing the best thing. And another thing he said is to die at the right time and to die at the right time, you need to have heirs. So he's a big thing on, on having heirs, someone to pass the ball on to. So like children could be that if you have children but also students who work underneath you and who are sort of striving in the same direction of you can be heirs, you know, to you. It looked like there was some deep going on on the screens of Anise and Mike. Do either of you guys have anything to throw in? You go ahead, Anissa, if you have something. I, I am thoroughly enjoying it and thinking about it. I don't know that I have anything like specifically to say, I guess, but I'm uh, I'm contemplating a lot of it and I, and I really enjoyed it, Cadell. So thank you. Like the chain, by the way, Mike, falling. 
<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think we have some overlapping hip hop interests, and that's where I that's where I cling to my cling to the blame I like here. It. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything specific to add. But I found it like really a great lecture, and I identify with a lot of this, like. Um, yeah, overcoming oneself and challenging uh, our own kind of ideas and preconceptions. So, yeah, and that heart energy makes me think, uh, and the heart like part makes me think of uh, Mark Gaffney and uh, the energy of Eros and uh, how that sex and, and love can transform the whole relationship we have to everything. Hannes, didn't you talk about this in your presentation uh, uh, last week, no, no, two weeks ago, when you were talking about what you had experienced and so on? Wasn't it along those lines? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was like really similar, this idea of uh, the logos and the pathos and, and having this oscillation between the logos and the pathos. And for me, as like in my own life, um, having these two sides being disconnected and then through the heart that's opening that overflowing of the heart and a feeling that's connected everything together um, make it more embodied make it all make sense yeah i think i have one more question uh Cadell, because was we were talking about it today uh, as nietzsche and madness I, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if you have any insights, or have you, if you thought about why he went mad. I mean, when I talked to Alexander about it, he says, "Well, he had syphilis," and I, I wonder if there's a deeper reason why he went mad, and if he fell in his own abyss and that kind of thing. I, you know, um, I, I love Nietzsche. I don't want to criticize him. I like the way you're you're doing this without you know giving critiques or or anything. But why did why did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, like I, I have like actually quite like a strong aversion to this whole line of like Nietzsche, you know, like of, of like criticizing Nietzsche in this way, like like oh he went mad or like look at look at look at how Nietzsche spent the last year of his life. I think I think even just like taking a close look at the prologue of Thus Spoke Zarathustra points already towards okay, he's totally okay with dying for, you know, striving for greatness and dying, and that you might go mad along the way, like. This is a like basically he's saying the conditions of possibility for madness and death are built into the philosophy. Like there's no guarantee here. <laughs> like you're not going to have a happy ending. That mm. that's the wrong way of thinking. Like mm. the whole the whole way of thinking that presupposes a happy ending. Where like what? Where like what? What do you? How do you want him to die? Like like in a, like a nice. Uh, a comfy house with like a lot of like family around him or something like that like he didn't he that's not what that's not what he's 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 sort of saying he's he's i think what nietzsche would be more concerned about is whether or not he had philosophical heirs and i think he does have philosophical heirs sure mm -hmm. like deleuze and heidegger are huge philosophical heirs so like and 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 it goes on and on and on you could say that psychoanalysis is an heir to nietzsche so like he lived in such a way he wasn't living his life so that he had a happy ending. He lived his life so that the conditions of possibility that he could spiral into madness and, and death. And that's fine because what he was paving the way for was the overman, which is a process of constantly overcoming yourself. And look at how many young people, young men he influenced in the 20th century. So I think that's his happy ending. His yeah. happy ending is, that's his happy ending, which is not him. It's not related yeah. to him. Sure. It's not related to him. Sure, but he also, you know, also people took him the, the wrong way, and he had a very awful airs as well. I, you know, you know, I no, I'm, I don't know. I, I, I agree. I, I like what you're saying, and, and I'm following it. But My, the, 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 mo the main point is that it, he, he wasn't living in such a way that he was trying to preserve himself. He was not living in that way. That wasn't his goal, and his goal wasn't a happy ending. That wasn't his goal. He would say that the whole idea of preserving yourself for a long time and the whole idea of living in such a way is that you're trying to find a happy ending is itself what he's getting trying to get out of. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think Quinn has his hand up. 
Yeah, awesome stuff. Thanks, Cadell. Um, I, by the way, highly recommend uh, Cadell's course. I just took the the Hegel course. He's a phenomenal teacher and it's it a great experience. So just throw that plug in there. Um, and my question, yeah, I'm curious, thinking this relationship between um, Hegel and Nietzsche, obviously it's their their styles are so are so very yeah. different. Um, so completely different. And and I, I was I was reading something from Kierkegaard and he was kind of critiquing Hegel saying, you know, he builds this 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 massive uh, this massive system and then lives in a hut outside of it or, or some something along those lines. Um, and and Nietzsche, you know, it, it definitely comes through for me stronger that he is living within his philosophy very deeply. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm curious how you are thinking this relationship between Hegel and Nietzsche, maybe some where you see similarities there or differences. Yeah, for sure. So I actually have, um, so like, um, in the, I forget if it was the first, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to show you a slide basically, but uh, I'm just going to pull it up, but I don't know if you remember from, I think it was probably the first course on Hegel. I, I did a slide image where I tried to put them in relationship to each other. So if my computer cooperates, I'm going to, I'm just going to show you that slide and then it'll show you like sort of the image in my head and, and how I'm trying to, to think this. Yeah. Okay. I've got it. All right. So for those of you who, who, who weren't in that class, I think most of you, um, this is a slide that I used in, in the first course of the phenomenology of spirit. And right there, you see the structure of the phenomenology of spirit. And like you see here, Hegel constructing a big system and then kind of like living outside of it in a sense as a dialectician. Well, phenomenology of spirit is a science of experience where he's trying to show you um, a dialectical process for what let's say call the ordinary process of conscious development. Now, and he speaks in such a way as like he's trying to give you an objective dialectical viewpoint of that process. So he's speaking in the phenomenology of spirit almost like he's outside of it. Now, I think Nietzsche is the opposite of Hegel because thus spoke Zarathustra is almost like Zarathustra is taking you on the inside view of the process of conscious development. He's taking you in the messiness. He's taking you through the existential singularity. He's taking you through the cracks of his own struggles with social life, his own struggles with being alone, his own, his own path, which is not generalizable, which is not universalizable. So I think what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to put them into combination as the inside and the outside view of spiritual objectivity. Um, and I think in, if you look at it in that way, they complement each other very nicely because what Nietzsche is pointing towards with the overman and what he explores as the overman is, I think, a, a further deepening of our understanding of absolute knowing um, and also um, a helpful ethical singularity when it comes to dealing with the, the mess of transitions between, say, reason and spirit and spirit and religion and so forth. So that's, that's how I'm, I'm trying to think that. Yeah, but they're, that's total, awesome. but they're totally opposites. Yeah, yeah, because right, right away the the notion of the overman and self overcoming is kind of an implicit process of of the embodied dialectic. It's like it is a constant process of dying to yourself. So that 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 immediately um, kind of kind of shown through when I when I went back to to Nietzsche a little bit. Um, it's like but, it's like like in your in. Quinn also did a, a great presentation, which I re recommend checking out, which you can find on the Philosophy Portal site about the comparison between Hegel and Buddhism. And in your presentation, you identify what I like you called the, um, the, the missing dimension of becoming um, in the negation of negation. And I think that 
Like what I've been trying to do in reading Thus Spoke Zarathustra is apply the logic of negation of negation to Zarathustra's own philosophy. And I think that that is a more productive technical reading than Deleuze's, mm. reading, of, than Deleuze's reading of pure affirmation. I don't think pure affirmation is a fair assessment of what Nietzsche is doing because he takes you through complex negations as well. And I think that that needs to be included. So I think negation of negation here can be applied to Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Can you explain briefly what you mean by the pure affirmation? Yeah, so I can give you like a very concrete model for that's, that's, so one, Deleuze is talking about pure affirmation in his work, and he's trying to, to negate Hegel by saying that Hegel sort of leaves us in the universe of neg ne negativity or leaves us in the universe of negation. And so he tries to open up this universe of affirmation. Um, and he, he tries to paint Nietzsche as a figure of affirmation, you know, and I think that this yay saying of Nietzsche can be, can be framed in this way. However, if you read the process of coming to be of Zarathustra, I think actually how he gets to affirmation is through negation of negation. So the model he uses throughout the whole book is the model of the camel, the lion, and the child. And the camel, the lion, and the child as a process is a negation of negation, which leaves you with the child as a pure affirmation, but you don't get to a pure affirmation without going through the camel and the lion, right? And the camel is a negativity. And the lion, mm. is, a neg and the lion is a negation of that negativity. So you only get to the affirmation through a complex process of negation of negation. That would be my argument. I, I could keep going with questions, but uh, we'll see if anyone else has Well, anything. do you, do you, you want to, go. shall we continue? Normally, this is our cutting off time, and we move into a kind of informal, uh, uh, you know, uh, chat at around uh, 9.30, like, but we, uh, do you want to, does, do people want to keep going here? Um, I mean, can, well, can you stick question. around any longer first? Yeah, off, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you interested in it, 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 continuing on this conversation a bit more? Or, or yeah, if, the, if, the, if, if, the, if there's if there's natural natural questions, that, then I'll stay. And if not, I, I don't mind you guys going to informal. So if there are natural questions, I, I can stay. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna get a water. The, I like kind of building on the uh, what was said just now like i read a bunch of nietzsche when i was 19 and um didn't understand a lot of it but i think the yeah. way i described it the other day it was like i think it laid a few stealth nukes in my thinking it kind of like dislodged yeah. some of the certainties from the rational scientific universe and it kind of took a long time for the impact of those nukes to really be felt but i think it's like I think when I eventually did pick up the phenomenology of spirit, there are multiple points where I kind of recognize Nietzsche in it. Yeah. And I can't exactly think of any of what they were, but there was something like in the, whatever he'd been trying to achieve with, with his, what, whatever Nietzsche had been trying to achieve with his writing, it kind of trained me, I think, to understand a bit of what dialectics was doing. Absolutely. I, I'd also want to like say, I'm going to, every time I get a chance to say this, I'm going to say it. There's actually not many people know that actually Hegel was the first philosopher to say God is dead. There's two lines in Phenomenology of Spirit where Hegel says God is dead. Nietzsche picks that from Hegel. So, but usually wow. it's connected directly to Nietzsche, but it's it, twice in the Phenomenology of Spirit. Why did he say that? And... What? Why I even Hegel think Hegel say that. I, I, I even think Hegel's reading of God is dead is superior to Nietzsche's. But the <laughs> the 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 the, lo the logic the logic the logic behind it was you know how Bard talks about in Hegel like the 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 dialectics of paradigmatics. It's kind of like the death of God is kind of like the death of a paradigm, and a paradigm kind of exhausts itself and then needs to be reborn from the abyss of itself type of thing. And this is how Hegel understands the concept is that the concept is basically like the parad uh, is like a paradigm for a certain social way of being, which has a certain potentiality, 
which exhausts itself and then needs to be reborn for a new time in history. And so when Hegel's talking about God is dead, he's often talking about basically the death of the paradigm of the, let's say, the theopolitical order in which German idealism itself is possible. And I think Hegel's, hist because Hegel's such a, he's the ultimate philosopher of history, is the way he reads the death of God, I think it can be extended to any death of a paradigm in the history of civilization ever. The de God has died many times and been reborn many times. And it's a death of a childhood uh, in some kind of a way of a civilization. I mean, what I mean is, is uh, you could also look at psychoanalysis and say it's, it's the end of childhood dependency uh, on a big other or some, something like that, right? You know, on, on a larger historical um, level. I think, I think, I think, I think psych psychoanalysis probably could have only ever been possible in, in an era in which God was dead. Like, because it, it's kind of like, you, you know, your, your body can speak in the void now. And it's interesting to think about, okay, well, psych, like a Hegelian reading of psychoanalysis, like psychoanalysis as an institution certainly had its day and, and fell away in, in many senses as an institution. You know, like it, it's, you know, there was a time in which like everyone in middle America was going to a psychoanalyst as like a, like a fashionable thing to do. And then, and then now, now I grew up, and probably by the looks of the ages of people in this room, we we grew up in the era of, of pharmacological psychology, where now instead of going and speaking about your traumas, well, let's just give you pills for your trauma. Well, what's next? And that's that's the, <laughs> next is probably psychedelics. <laughs> so yeah, right. Let's give you of some course, psychedelics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's give you some psychedelics for your trauma. <laughs> Which is a co continuation of the same, but but it's but a more let's say a refined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that the important distinction between pharma pharmacology and psychedelics, which I made when I was working for that psychedelic company, was that the pharmacological solution is to numb you and repress you. Right. Right. And the psycho and the psychedelic way is to like blast you open to the deepest emotions you can possibly experience. Yeah. And then the now I, my my solution would be a dialectical one that we need to combine psychedelics with psychoanalysis because you get blasted open to your deepest experiences, and then you should probably be seeing an analyst. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's funny because and then you should go even like further back. To, you should be seeing a, a religious person as well, like. Like, uh, like maybe, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's where I would go with that. But come to Andrew's temple and meditate. Yeah, because I would, <laughs> these things don't go away, right? No. I mean, the death of God. God doesn't really die. He he just he just you know comes back again, right? God dies as a virtual guarantee. Yeah. And it's interesting. It, 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 in Hegel, the 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 phrase "God is dead" shows up in the chapter on religion. And I believe yeah. in the section of on revealed religion, which is the which, which is the last section before absolute knowing. So it is sort of like the the death of like the paradigm of God is what brings um, the subject into the stage of absolute knowing. So just thinking that the historical movement of Nietzsche is like maybe like a subject of absolute knowing proclaiming for proclaiming the death of god um is is interesting yeah i i that i almost like read like you could pat like view nietzsche as like okay hegel sort of ends with the state of absolute knowing and then nietzsche just picks up as like what would a subject of absolute knowing write about something like that like and it's like the thus book zarathustra comes out like that's that's the way i guess i think of that but like yeah the, 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 the interesting from like the hegelian point of view on this God is dead thing is uh, one thing I've become more aware of is that there's a huge bifurcation in the he history of Hegelian scholars with theological or atheistic interpretations of Hegel. And funny enough, the atheistic interpretations of Hegel have been more concretely impactful than the theological interpretations of Hegel. 
So like the most powerful, of course, being Marxism, which is an atheistic interpretation of Hegel. And that had huge concrete impacts on the world. There's, there's something extraordinarily powerful about going as deep into atheism as you can. <laughs> you know, and, and there's something of like a, a stop gap that appears with, with religion is like almost like a, no further, no further, no further. It's kind of interesting on that note, right, that like religious people will often look at atheism or especially kind of philosophical atheism and say this is a kind of nihilism and it's a dead end and it's the the hole that we've gotten into with culture at the moment but it's not the only way to look at atheism like there is the well i mean like there's nietzsche's affirmative nihilism right but there's that um <laughs> what well, once the gods are dead then there's a freedom. I don't know where I'm going quite with this. It feels like there's, yeah, like there's a freedom, but it kind of, it turns inside out on itself. Like, uh, cause it's such a natural progression of like the atheist to come from like the, you know, the scientific viewpoint and then, and then just explore that to like its ends, like, like Cadell talked about transhumanism and, and like you get to this point where you're just like, holy fuck. <laughs> This, this doesn't make any fucking sense. This isn't it. <laughs> and then you go, and then you kind of like circle back to like religious ideas. I, I think that's a, that's another. It's a really good good, good idea to, to jump off on because like with the transhumanists, it's another example where like going through atheism to its extreme, like you do have enormous concrete impacts on the world. So like for example, with the transhumanists, like they structure the whole of like Google. And like they structure like Silicon Valley, like that they structure the technological developments, like the artificial intelligence and stuff like that. So there's a way in which like going in, like going full throttle into the atheistic viewpoint is like just gonna. There, there's a potentiality for a lot of concrete impact, but then like, yeah, there's also the possibility for like huge uh, mistakes, and transhumanists might might be another one of them. There's, the mistake is maybe that that the, the atheism becomes a new theism, right? So the God becomes right. a machine. Exactly. 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 Yeah. You yeah, can't well, get I out like of this thing in communism. Yeah. Yeah. I like the conversation that you and Thomas Hamelrick have been developing precisely around using Gerard to kind of formulate this, this Christian atheism. It's like it seems like you and Thomas are kind of bringing together Zizek and Gerard. And I have a sense that you're going to do something pretty terrifyingly awesome. I hope so. And it's it, it's like, <laughs> I guess Gerard is saying that Christianity is actually always the religion that kills God. Yeah, that's like, the power there, of Christianity. Like, like uh, pre-Christianity um, or, or other religions that in some way work with the scapegoat mechanism, God is ultimately a symbol for the founding murder that structures society. Or like you could say God is a symbol for like a nice way of dressing up violence. But then in the wake of the Christian revelation or other revelations, you can no longer hide violence behind the symbol of God, which means you have to confront the reality of violence and the psyche as what it really is. Which is the only way to do culture from hence from this way forward, and that's it's interesting that that kind of shows up in some of Nietzsche's writings, where he's talking about like greeting a more warlike age. There's a sense of like stuff is going to be violent, stuff is going to be crazy, stuff is going to be mad because God is dead. Yeah, he even he even says like the overman needs an overdragon. Like the, he's like he says like the ev he even like says like the evil to come, and like the battles to come. And the wars to come will be will put the past wars and the past evils to shame. Like there'll be more. Like the, we have way more to confront, much more monstrous things to confront than than that's been confronted. And I think that that's also prophetic because if you look at the 20th century, there were monsters and evil that occurred on a scale that 
you could say is a, a new scale of evil and a new scale of monstrosity. There's some element of like the religious structures or practices or whatever they will be of this post Nietzschean age, post Darwinian age are going to need to grapple with that. Yeah. With no nice way to dress it up. I think you could say that like there's lots of efforts at the moment to, um, to kind of repress that fact. Like for example, the, the way that, that fascism or Nazism has kind of become like, it's a horrible thing, but the way it's also become a symptom in culture, like everybody agrees you have to hate those guys. It, it, like the symbol for that is like, we're not evil, they're evil. It's a Absolutely. symbol for evil. I think it's, so it's an attempt symbol. to create a religious structure. Like uh, I, I can't remember who said it, but the, the, someone said like World War II or the end of World War II is the founding myth of the West that it is today. And the West, like the religion of the West is based on being not Nazi Germany. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think H that's Hitler a has huge replaced symptom. Satan. And Hitler, and Hitler is God. Like yeah. if you look at the power of Hitler and the symbol of the swastika, it, it, it carries a religious weight. I think if you could compare anything to that founding gesture, what I'm playing with is the idea of how much of 21st century culture in a global context is based on the founding gesture of 9-11. And then Bin Laden is kind of like that figure, like the ultimate evil, like the ultimate violence, you know, like it, it, it and then and like how much, how much of our global politics is a response to that negativity, a response to that violence. It's like a lot. A lot. On the other hand, that's sort of fading in a way. I feel like it doesn't endure. Like, we, we need a I new I feel like violence. Hitler Hitler won't fade. Hitler is kind of like, but but Bin Laden and, and all that is sort of, that's kind of fading. Maybe we, maybe there are sort of just rep repetitions of that dynamic. Yeah, you're, it's definitely definitely true. There's some some fading of the, the the power of that moment, and and no no question, World War II left a more profound mark on our collective psyche than 9/11. But there is some uh, it, it's a, the, the way the way in which extreme acts of of violence that stretch the imagination yeah. um, massively shape the global psyche. I mean, it, it's like, I don't, I don't, other than 9-11, I'm not sure if we've seen like an explosion of violence yet that like would rival, say, for example, the Rwandan genocide or the Holocaust or, you know, things of that nature. But, I think there was a feeling when the Ukraine conflict broke out that it could be one of those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah, it sort of seems wrong. to have like fizzled out like we're all kind of I, well if i pay attention to how it feels in my life it's like everyone kind of knows it's going on but everyone's also sort of forgotten about it at the same time johnny depp is more important at the moment right yeah, yeah. i i don't know amber heard was an explosion of violence that, that is going to scar our collective psyche for decades to come Excellent. you know and, and 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 let's let's just hope johnny depp when we see pirates of the caribbean six <laughs> and we see, we see, we see future yeah. great Johnny Depp masterpieces. Yeah. <laughs> and let's celebrate her downfall, like you know, if she's like Lady Macbeth or something. Yeah. It's it's interesting to because you're talking about like the Nazis as the you know the ultimate enemy of the 20th century, and then with the Ukraine conflict, it kind of became like we just pretended that the Azov Battalion wasn't actually like a Nazi organization and everybody was like, oh, now we support them. And uh, right. they're, they're, they're fighting for the good guys now. So it's a weird flip there. I think this is why Nietzsche was so adamant about building a philosophy beyond good and evil. And like, I think that's one of the things that um, I want to focus a lot of interpretation on throughout the course is like, what, what actually Nietzsche trying to get at with his notion of beyond good and evil? Because to me, what it looks like is he's trying to articulate that good and evil are more like a continuum and that actually you need to be connected to your deepest, darkest evil in order to achieve your highest greatness. And that doesn't necessarily mean to act out your, your deepest evil, but to know what's in you and to be intimately sort of in conversation with it. And if you create from that space, 
that's how you become great. I think that's his basic idea. Yeah. Yeah, Google, don't be. So you think that Carl Jung was very influenced by Nietzsche in that case with the, the idea of the shadow, you know, that seems to be what he was saying as well. Yeah, I never, I, I, I knew, I knew that he had read a lot of Nietzsche, but I, but I, I didn't connect Nietzsche as being the origin of that way of thinking, and maybe he is. You it's know, the, quite, that we have to connect probable. with our, the, our own Satan rather than having Satan over there. You know, um, you know, there's, there's so many psychoanalytic ideas in Nietzsche. It's, it's wild. It's wild. It's like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's the philosopher. Of, he's, he's, he's like, I think some people have called him like the first proper psychologist, you know, <laughs> like someone who really like explored their psyche. It's, it's also interesting to see that like Nietzsche wrote something of Stendhal, the novelist, like he came across some of Stendhal's books and loved them. They're deeply psychological novels. And then in the, in the 20th century, late 20th century, like, Girard's coming to Stendhal as well and writing a lot about Stendhal psychology. And I don't know if Girard talks about Nietzsche so much, but it's like. Oh, he does, doesn't he? He, talk, he speaks quite a bit about Nietzsche. In, uh... Well, I haven't read it if it's, if it's there, but it's, I guess it's kind of fascinating to see that genesis of psychoanalysis, like round about this 18th, 19th century turning point people yeah. really starting to explore the unconscious and its madness in art and philosophy until it kind of gets to a Freud and he kind of starts to formalize it more. I remember yeah. Gerard's critique of, of Nietzsche was that he was celebrating the Dionysian and the Dionysian is actually the mob. And he was saying that Nietzsche got that wrong because the Dionysian is actually the, the you know, is the herd, is the mob that, that Nietzsche was criticizing. Anyway, that's just, on the side. All right, guys. Well, I think I should let you guys get to your more informal meeting, unless there's like another pressing question. But uh, I'm interested to know about your take on uh, on Eminem and and Jungian psychology of the of the shadow with Slim Shady. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can apply it to hip hop for sure, man. And like yeah. the whole, the whole, the whole, alt, whole alter ego. Like, I mean, <clears throat> Eminem is a Eminem is a perfect example of someone who achieved perhaps the highest greatness you could in music, and he did it precisely by connecting as intimately as possible with his darkest evil. <laughs> like, if you listen, like if you if you if you if you listen to like the first album, or like if you listen to like perhaps his darkest song, the song Kim. Like there's there, I, I would argue there's no more darker song than the song Kim. Like you want to go as dark as possible, you listen to that song. I've only been like I, it's, it's actually like a good song, but it's like hard to listen to. So you listen to he's like got twice. a few. He's got a few songs yeah. that are that pretty, go that level, pretty dark that you don't put on. Yeah. on certain people. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, but yeah, and especially like juxtaposed in like the late '90s of like the very like bubblegum pop like boy band type of stuff he just came in with it was just like the ultimate destruction of that and like when when totally. like the united states and that popular culture was just not confronting that that shadow and then and then there was like the events like the columbine shooting and like that that yeah. you know were were pinned on him because he was this character that was it was like they were like oh you were you're influencing this because you are exposing the shadow Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think like you can't understand like his first albums without understanding that where the context in which he was creating those albums was where like the dominant archetype for the male was like that bubblegum pop, Justin Timber like type of image. And yeah, he just totally broke the yeah. entire frame. Just totally yeah. broke the entire frame. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I'll just thank you, uh, Cadell, and we'll, I'll end the recording now, um, and and we can uh, we can just you know uh, casually uh, slide off into uh, the abyss. <laughs> but uh, that, that was awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Casually slide off into the abyss.
Yeah. Okay. Well, I wish you guys all the best in the abyss, and uh, it's good to have some companions in the abyss. So, uh, have have fun to the abyss. <laughs> See you later, man. Peace out. Thanks for thanks for thanks for listening. <laughs>